when you go in hospital and you see suffering of people, your your point of view about life change. Yeah. It was completely unexpected episode in, in our life and it shake all our family. When he passed away, I I decided to, to finish my PhD, but I wanted to change my life. In some aspect, I, I, I didn't realize at, the, at that moment it would have been in, uh, in cycling or in sport in general. I just wanted to do something big, like live life in a really good way, in a quality way, uh, giving like 200% of myself in, in every day. Hey listeners, Jeffrey Wu here and welcome to HVMN Podcast. September 13th, 2018, that was a day Italian cyclist Vittoria Busi set a new world record for one of cycling's oldest and most prestigious challenges, the UCI Hour. Unlike outdoor cycling, the hour is uniquely absent of variables. There's no jostling for position. There's no reliance on teammates. It's just you, the bike, the time clock, and the velodrome, which is a circular indoor track. For one hour straight, the rider powers through laps, attempting to cover the most distance possible within the one hour time limit. Victoria is now the fastest women's time trial cyclist in the world, surpassing 48 kilometers in a single hour. She's the new world record holder, and we're proud to fuel her with HVMN Ketone. Victoria joins the podcast today, and I was inspired hearing her tell her story. I know you will be inspired too. We discuss what motivates someone to truly want to be the best of the best, the subtleties of velodrome cycling, and the power of an introspective mind. Before we get into this episode, I want to share something with you all. I founded HVMN more than five years ago when I was deep in my own biohacking journey, figuring out how I could optimize work performance. What I found on the web were sketchy products that made unsubstantiated claims or nootropic ingredients that you would have to manually mix together and basically be your own mad scientist. I wanted to change that and make elite human performance accessible for everyone. With HVMN products, such as our performance supplements, we take an evidence-based consumer first approach. This is a founding principle that continues today. If you enjoy how I go in depth with each and every one of my guests, take that a hundred times further. That's how we think about our products at HVMN. Starting today, we are excited to launch a new initiative that we hope adds real value to the show. Exclusive to our podcast listeners, Every month, we'll be introducing a new offer that you can claim by visiting www.hvmn.com slash pod. This offer will last the entirety of the month before it becomes replaced by the next month's new offer. Essentially, hvmn.com slash pod is your permanent gateway to these new monthly exclusive to podcast listener deals. For the entirety of December, we're hooking up listeners with a 15% off our performance supplements line, a selection of supplements and nootropics that targets the essentials of energy, focus, memory, sleep, brain health, and metabolism. It's a well-rounded nootropic kit that is meant for anyone looking to take their performance and well-being to the next level. Of course, make sure you're on top of the fundamentals. That's sleep, nutrition, and exercise. There's a good chance you can get to 90% of where you want to be by optimizing those three basics. But HVMN performance supplements will aid you in getting that remaining 10% from human to superhuman. The link to the offer, www.hvmn.com slash pod, is also included in the show notes. As a podcast sponsored by the HVMN business, this is the best way to directly support the show and our work. Of course, writing reviews and sharing the show with your friends is just as appreciated as always. Without further ado, enjoy this episode of the HVMN podcast. Victoria, thanks so much for visiting and coming by the San Francisco headquarters. Thank you very much for for let me come here. Yeah. I mean, first of all, congratulations on setting the new hour record. I mean, that's one of the oldest, most prestigious cycling records. Yeah. Um, congratulations. I mean, it's a, thank you. Thank I mean, you. it's a, an incredible achievement. Um, before diving into all of that, I think, you know, how San Francisco, this is your first time in the city, right? Yeah. It's, it's amazing. You, you, you see photos on the web, but yeah. you don't realize um, how, how much is like the atmosphere. It's it's really characteristic, and uh, I I was lucky to be on already on a ride. 
yeah. uh, on the Golden Bridge, Golden Gate Bridge, and okay, uh, the weather was not really nice with me <laughs> because it was foggy. Yeah, but it's still so emotional, and uh, and yeah, the, the 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 most beautiful thing is the atmosphere, and uh, it's it's kind of magic to be here. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. We'll we'll definitely need to show you around the city in the next couple of days. So. You have a very interesting story just personally coming from a mathematical background and going to cycling. For folks that haven't quite gotten to, to your story yet, um, you know, how did that uh, interest in cycling start from? Where did that come from? Um, how has your experience with mathematic, mathematics informed um, potentially your, your cycling career? Everything uh, happened really fast uh, because uh, when I started cycling, I was in Oxford. Mm -hmm. uh, I was mm, finishing my PhD in mathematics mm -hmm. um, in uh, in the Oxford University, and uh, I was out of competition. I, I was used to compete in uh, track and field, and I was out of competition for like for a while because I decided to to be full time a student to pursue my dream of uh, an academic career. So were you a high school track and field athlete or like a college athlete? Uh, we don't have college culture in uh, in Italy. Okay. Uh, I, I did athletics when I was in Italy. So when I moved to Oxford, I decided to stop because if I, I, I competed quite highly but in a track and field. So Which event? I was uh, running in um, uh, 1,500 meter okay. and 5,000 meter okay. in the track. It's like a middle distance uh, runner. You're, so you're, yes, okay. yes. I started to train for the 10,000 meter, always in the track. Huh. Uh, but then I decided to, to stop. So who knows um, what I would have been able to do. If That's I interesting. Going. I mean, usually when we have athletes on this program that are, you know, at the top leagues or, you know, Olympic team members, they've been playing that sport since they were a kid. Yeah. But yeah. You, so you weren't cycling as a child, were you? No, as a child, I was everything except so you're cyclist. So you were a runner. Yeah, I was a runner. Also because my parents were, were really scared about me falling from the bike. So I had like two wheels on, on the rear. Uh, like the training yes, wheels. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I was like uh, really uh, like behind other uh, cyclists because I, I I didn't have the chance to practice because okay. my parents were too scared that I would have fall down. So. But did you have an interest? Were you always interested in cycling? Yes, it was like um, I, I like sport that you have to do alone. Okay. Uh, even if there are teams in cycling, at the end of the day, you're just it's just you and your bike. So I, I still think that cycling is um, is something that you have to to be uh, just you. So like running, uh, like swimming, uh, like tennis. So um, I, I have preference for a sport that involves just you. So you're not a team sport player. Mm, not you're an really. Sport no, I have player. to say yes. <laughs> I tried volleyball, but I, I didn't like much. So. It's, so you grew up yeah. playing a lot of sports, I guess, and you just gravitated towards the yeah. individual sport. I did many things, and uh, um, I mean, also swimming for for a while. Uh, but the, the the thing is, I was in running a lot of years, yeah. and uh, when it started to be like um, a kind of professional uh, activity, I decided to stop because. I wanted to concentrate on the on the studies. Right. So that was the point when I when I moved to to Oxford. So when you were a kid, you're a, a girl. You're looking at what you wanted to do in the future. Did you want to be a math professor? Did you want to be a professional athlete? What was you know a seven year old Victoria thinking about? <laughs> there are many things around because my parents always said to me, "Oh, you have to become a, a doctor because it's always good to have a doctor in family." Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> when I was a child, I said, "Okay, I have to be a doctor," <laughs> and um, but then you know it's it's always the your parent that. Uh, give you advice, but right. then you decide uh, what to do. And uh, at some points, I really wanted to do athletics okay. uh, in my life. Uh, but then I met a teacher at the school and uh, I just fall in love with mathematics. I even didn't know about um, a math, uh, mathematics specialization at the university. Right. Uh, also because I did uh, classical studies in uh, in school, like Latin, Greek, because Whoa. I was more so oriented. You, your, your undergraduate degree was in 
uh, not undergraduate, but high school. Okay, your high school. Yeah, okay. so was I did focused on okay. yeah ancient like Latin and Greek. So because I was oriented more on uh, my parents' suggestions, so to be a doctor, to be like a kind of what what we can say like a standard job. So a classical study would have been the the, the best thing to do. So right. I did a classical study, and then I met this teacher in the school. Uh, who said to me, uh, she said to me, okay, you're good in maths, why don't try? And it was a nice what challenge. What class was it? It was like a high school geometry or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Really basic because, you know, in, uh, in I don't know if you have here in US, but we have this uh, specialization in school, uh, which is very more for literature, um, right. Latin, uh, Greek, uh, history, and we do not much about mathematics. Okay. So we had like two hours in total for a week of mathematics. Whoa, so it was really, really basic. Yeah. So it was completely a new challenge for me to then go to the uh, to the university in maths because there you meet also people that come from scientific uh, school. Right. So where they do like uh, three times what we do in the classical school. So and You must have had some kind of innate talent because it's not easy to catch up if you've just been doing a lot yeah. less hours of mathematics. Yeah, I, I mean, did you just yeah. always have a knack for just visualizing the theorems? I mean, I, you know, I'm a computer scientist by background, did a lot of math and, you know, I was a person doing math competitions in middle school and high school, yeah. but I really respect folks like yourself who've been able to complete a PhD in pure math. I mean, it's... It was art. Really it's, it, hard. it's it's hard to visualize. This is not like you can do quick ca computations in your brain. This is not like mental math, little tricks. This is like, can you visualize very abstract concepts and, and, and write proofs for them? So I'm just curious to just go from your perspective. Does this like sort of naturally click for you? Like when you're going from high school math to being a budding math academic, like what was that process like for you? My talent is that I I can spend a lot of time on something. Mm. I mean, I'm I I'm really focused focused person. I'm really constant in um in my program. When I do a program, I I respect my my timetable and and everything. So I I completely concentrated like full time uh, trying to learn mathematics from the basic. So um, I think. I, I spent like, uh, I don't know, I was like sleeping four hours every night to, to catch up with the other. And uh, at the, the end of the third wow. year, when I got the, uh, the, the, the first degree, uh, I, I was the same level of the other and maybe more because I, I was like really um, trying to catch up with, with others. So I have more motivation maybe than other people. Interesting. And uh, and then I I fall in love with the um, at, at the end of the third year you have to decide between applied maths or pure maths and I fall in love with pure maths mm -hmm. so really abstract uh, theories that have not much to do with reality right and I specialize in uh, algebraic geometry yeah and then I start to dream about uh, going uh, out of Italy for for studying so you're probably probably dreaming in like hyperdimensional space. Yeah. Like manifolds, right? <laughs> it's always something that I wish I kind of spent more time in, in college looking at because I think it is uh, not necessarily practical in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in real life, but these are like interesting topics to be able yeah. to grapple with yeah. in, in school. Um, I mean, that's, that's an interesting story because like you, you basically were able to catch up and it you sounds like you credit a lot of that to your work ethic and discipline. Did you always have that? Um, did you just grow up as a kid, just be more disciplined than everyone else? Or was this a skill, a personality trait that you created for yourself? Like, where do you think that comes from? You mean the, the organization? The, yeah, the work the, ethic, right? Like if you're just yeah. sleeping four hours a day just yeah. to do math and I guess what, doing what, math 18 hours a day, 20 hours a day? More or less, yes. <laughs> like... I mean, I, I definitely was not that disciplined. You know, I wasn't doing math and computer science for 20 hours a day at Stanford. So, I mean, yeah, what was that difference? It's what what like, clicked for you? I think I, I was born like that, like okay. uh, seeing the life or white or black. So when I start to do something, I want to perform at my best. 
which doesn't mean that it's the it's the best, yeah. it, but it's just my best. So like I, I would say I want to be the best at what I do too. And I'm sure the listeners, I, I think, that are listening to this program are also motivated people. But I think there's a difference between, yes, I want to be the best I can be and then translating that to, I'm going to do 20 hours of math a day for four years. If you have passion, if you have like a goal, I think you can do that. It's, um, it's art every morning. That's, that's the, the worst thing. So wake up, uh, go out of the bed and you know, that you have this kind of day, uh, that it's, it's going to be like every day will be the same for a long period of time because you need to be like constant and you have a, you need to have a routine in your life without, um, much, um, other things around, uh, and uh, be concentrated on what you want to, to do. Yeah. And so when you wake up in the morning, you really need the motivation. And uh, it's, it's the same when I did the, the hour. Like, find the motivation every morning is the, I think it's the key. Yeah. And what, is, what was that motivation for you? I mean, is that just internal? Like, you just had a fire? That, yeah, it's... I mean, was it, were there it, ever days where you're like, I, I don't want to do this? It, I mean, I, I, like, it's, like it's, it must be, at least i thinking for myself, it's not necessarily easy to sustain that kind of pace for such a long period of time right uh, but but not for you apparently for me something that works is that um when i wake up in the morning i say at the end of these days i don't want to have regrets and i want that this day is better than yesterday and tomorrow will be better than today so like it's you see like uh you are constructive this way and you see like your life like constructing every right. day day by day uh your your dream and at some point, your dream are very close. So you see that the dream is approaching. Yeah. But you need like to think like day by day. So I, I don't have big goal. Uh, I mean, I, I have the main goal, but in uh, in approaching the main goal, I don't have big goal. Like I see just one day and I say, okay, I want to live this day 200%. And uh, at the end of the day, I want to be happy and without regrets about what I've done. So you break down this really, really long journey into Yes, tactical exactly. steps and just make study practice every single day. That's inspiring in a lot of ways because I think when people look at people that break world records, it's like, oh, how does one become the best in the world? And it's like a very impossible long journey. But if you can just decom- decompose that problem yeah, exactly. into small steps, then it's yeah. every day is not something you can't you can't do. It's too big if you think about the world yeah. project. Yeah, like it's the same the academic career or the the hour record or my next project and right. so it's too big if you look at the at the end of the tunnel but was yeah. it ever like uh you know while you're at university you know there's like a party that you wanted to go to or your friends wanted to go to a concert or i don't know what yeah. you know yeah i mean how did you deal with that kind of social peer pressure because i think that maybe one thing that is more of a commentary on society at large is that i think a lot of people don't necessarily have like very clear visions of what they want to do in the future. Yeah. And it's easy to, you know, lower your own standards in some way. How did you combat that? Was that an issue when you, or, or did you just avoid people that didn't have dreams and goals? I don't avoid people that don't have dream, but I think the main problem is slightly different uh, from, from my point of view is that people are scared to be alone with themselves. Mm. So if you stay alone with yourself for a long period of time, it's, it's art, it's challenging. So the, 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 the thing that moves people to go out and hang out a lot too much sometimes is that they just don't want to come back home, uh, be alone with themselves and think about the, the future. Huh. Because you have to be brave to decide about your future. You have to be brave to, to say, I want to go there. It's it's a big dream yeah. and it's, yeah, you have to be brave and it's not easy. So be with yourself and be honest with yourself. It's something that many people try to avoid. Yeah. Sometimes I try to avoid and there are periods of my, of my life that I didn't have any dream, any goal and uh, it happened. It happened to anyone. So you've always been comfortable being by yourself then? So it, that it's, wasn't it's a process. Okay. I worked a lot on that. To be alone, uh, it's, it's scaring. Uh, for example, when I have to go to altitude training, 
So I have to be like higher than two, 2,000 meters right. in the mountains, uh, usually in a, a refu- refuge, the, how do you say, the, um, uh, in a hotel at the very top of the mountain. Okay. And there is nothing around. So you spend your days alone because refuge. you wake up. Yeah. Okay. You, yeah. you you wake up, you have to go on the bike, and then you come back, you have lunch alone, uh, and all the afternoon is alone. Yeah. And this is have to be for at least four weeks, because if you want the altitude to be effective, you need to be at least four weeks. Yeah, you need to adapt for it. Yeah. So you have to be prepared to be alone, and uh, your, your house is too far away, so you cannot go sometimes to, uh, to your friend, to your partner, so you have to be prepared to that. And similar and, to when you're doing your math career as well. You're yeah, just, in math career, it's, it's you're, the same. You're able because, to just sit down and just... Yeah, you have to be alone with your thoughts and yeah. with your ideas. And uh, you, you try to demonstrate a theorem. It doesn't work and you have to start again. And in the meantime, the whole day is gone and you have been alone yeah. on your desk. I've seen many people, for example, in Oxford, going to some coffee shop to work. Yeah. Just because they don't want to be alone. Right. And I did sometimes, but... That is something that uh, gives me the idea that people are scared to be alone with themselves. Right. That's, it's not that they don't have dream, but accept that you have a dream means also that you have to be you brave. Have to uh, you have or, to sacrifice. Right. I think that's something that I, that strikes close to home for myself. The, the thought of introspection or thinking about being in your own thoughts and realizing your weaknesses and areas that you need to improve. I think it's something that I've spent a lot of time in my own head, right? Because I think when you're trying to create a dream or a goal, you need to really assess honestly where you are at today and where you need to go. And I think I agree with you. I think a lot of people don't ask the hard questions about themselves in terms of, okay, what am I like not good at? What what should I do to actually change my life trajectory? And sometimes these are hard questions to ask yeah. themselves. So I think you you lie to yourself that you think you're better than you are or there's some excuse that you have. And oftentimes it's like, no, you just, there's no excuse. You're just like not good enough right now. Yeah. And like, what can you do to change to be a better exactly. version of yourself? Work on your weakness yeah. and try to, to sa- sacrifice something because, you know, that is your weakness and you have to work on that. Yeah. And it's, it's not easy. And yeah. It's, it's not something nice to do. So yeah. People don't just don't want to do that, but, but you like, have to do. If. But, yeah, I mean, it sounds like especially for you know what you did with the hour, like you almost are comfortable with the pain. Like the pain is not something to be scared of. It's just like okay, it's like a natural. No, process. That, that's not completely true. So you, you still don't like the pain. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm so scared about pain. I work a lot on that. It, again, when I I wake up in the morning, okay. and I know that I have to to suffer, and so how you motivate yourself, you need such a big motivation to convince yourself that you are prepared to suffer for a couple of hours at least. And, but also like the routine. So wake up and do your usual breakfast. You don't have to change anything because you know that your stomach is okay with your breakfast yeah. and uh, the, the timetable have to be uh, really precise right? because you want like to have to avoid any digestion problem. So it's hard because every day is the same as the the other days. So there is no nothing that changed. So it's it's hard to convince yourself that you're ready to the day. Right. Uh but so you need something really big uh, as a motivation and that's again, interesting. So even now I uh, you know you have spent hours I mean yeah uh what hundreds thousands of hours you know, training, even that like the incremental <laughs> a thousandth and one or like 10,000th hour of pain, suffering. That's just as scary or just you have just as much anticipation for that. Yeah, I think it's physiological. I mean, your body want to protect, your mind want to protect the body from suffering. So yeah. every training at some point, when you start to suffer, the mind sent to the body the message. Please I'm stop. done. I'm done. Stop. I'm done. Yeah. Stop. It's like a message that... But you've told your like, brain to be like, shut up. I know yeah, what exactly. I'm doing. That, so that, That's the most difficult thing. Okay. So when the fatigue arrives, you have to like be prepared and welcome the fatigue yeah. and understand, okay, I'm doing fatigue. That means that I'm working in a good way. Right. I have to keep going because it's this the moment in which I, I will grow up right. as an athlete. Wouldn't you say you have more confidence now that you've you, you're you, at some level, you could say you're an expert in, <laughs> in 
in, uh, understanding your own physiological limits and pushing past them. Do you feel more confident that you've done that so many times that you feel more confident for the next times you're asking more from your body? I can say I'm more confident. But the nice thing about sport is that your body surprises yourself every day if you if you go beyond your limits. Mm. So that that is the most interesting thing about sports. So the, the surprise that your body, uh, how your body reacts to the message of the mind to say, okay, let's stop now because you are done. And right. the bad, if you go beyond your limit, then you have this surprise that you can go really, really far from that message. Right. That, that is the most beautiful thing, yeah. I guess. I think I've seen that in myself, but some I feel like for me, I kind of revert back to my norm sometimes because like, oh, like that was like, I worked really hard to run, you know, an extra this extra pace or this extra distance. So oftentimes you, for a lot of athletes, you'll have like a new set point. You, you, you make a breakthrough. Yeah. You'll be able to uh, push beyond your your, ter- your typical limit. But oftentimes a lot of people revert back to that same set point. You know, they have a good day and then they'll like revert back yeah, to yeah. their previous standard. Um, but obviously for you, you're able to push your set point further and further and further where you have like a new baseline. Yeah. Um, is is that just a discipline, your body responding well to the training? You know, what do you credit for that in terms of being able to push that set limit beyond any other person? There are many, many days in training that your body doesn't respond well as yeah. you want. So because we are not machines. So, you know, sometimes there are just days in which the legs are tired right. or you're not focused enough. So there are many, many days, maybe more bad days than good days. So what what to do in case of a bad day? Yeah, Th- that's really difficult uh, answer to give because uh, I'm the first one to uh, throw the bike and start to cry and uh, <laughs> and say, oh, it's the end. Uh, I'm not going yeah. to do that. Uh, but then you know, it's the 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 thing I said before. You want to have no regrets at the end of the day. So okay, let's go back home. This day wasn't good. Let's try tomorrow. Or let's agree with the uh, coach another uh, uh, like another day of recovery. Yeah. Uh, so I have a plan for the future, uh, not a, a big plan, but just for the next days, help you to to understand what's going on. Yeah. It, it can be that there are bad days. It can be that the weather is bad and you cannot train, so you have to take another day of recovery, yeah. and you took already a day of recovery the day before and you start to get anxious because you are recovering too much. Right. There are many, many, many obstacles in training and um, and also you have a personal life. So sometimes it's just you have a discussion with your boyfriend and you don't want to go out. So right. it happened because we, we are human and that's, that's the most interesting thing. It sounds like what, you know, one other way to say what you're saying is that you have to be consistent over a long period of time. Yeah. There's going to be variation on yeah. your performance but if you can sustain that level of dedication for a long period of time i think people can be bursty in terms of i want to be really mo- really really motivated for you know three days and like yeah, you know, exactly. you're, you're really passionate for three days but yeah. i think to, to really be someone that you know sets a a, a a world record or break what's you know previously possible you need to be able to hold that passion for uh, for years, many years, right? Yeah. So bef- I, w- I want to talk about that, uh, but I want to just close the story around uh, your full-time math student, math academic. You went to Oxford to do your PhD in algebraic geometry, right? Um, and you weren't athlete- you weren't working out. Were you exercising too? Just like casual running. So you're uh, casually just yeah. keeping someone in shape, yeah, but you're just, not yeah, yeah. like the goal of being a professional athlete was. No, not was, there. Yeah, not in my mind. Absolutely. So <laughs> let's close that loop. So what was the story that got you back into, hey, I'm going to be a cycling professional? Uh, when I stopped it to, to be a track and field athlete, yeah. uh, I, okay, I decided to stop, but it was never a nice decision for me. So I always kept my agonistic side in my mm. heart. Uh, and uh, in, in the deep side, uh, of of my body, yeah. I always had that fire that yeah. I want to go back to sport. Uh, what was the decision point? Like, wh- why did you decide to go math versus being a track and field athlete? I, I don't want to give responsibility to my parents, but <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, when you have 
20 years old, you're young uh, and you you are really influenced by by your parents. Of course. Of course. Also because I had a lot of respect for them and yeah. uh, their career. Yeah. And so I was looking at them like, I, I want to be like you and I want to, to have this kind of life and right. things like that. It's, I think it's normal when you are like, not a child, but you are in that kind of age that you are a little bit in the, uh, in the side undecided yeah. about your future. So parents, in my opinion, have, have a good influence. They, they, they always give me freedom to decide, but I was influenced by them. And okay, they so like the role models me, kind of education. Yeah. Okay. They suggested me to go on with university yeah. and they, they gave me freedom to go out for study. So yeah. uh, I, I was like, I was lucky enough to, to be able to study without working, which is a privilege because not, not anyone, not everyone can, can study full time uh, and uh, in such a good university like right. Oxford. Um, so I, uh, I, w- I think I was lucky and I don't have regrets about that also because I still love maths and I miss maths and when, when again, I like read papers and things like that. So, yeah. um, but then, uh, bad thing in my life, I've lost my father. Uh, that that was really like a um, a long process uh, because he he got a stroke. How do you say yes? And um, so I was commuting one year uh, between uh, Oxford and Rome, my city, to visit him in hospital, and it was like really suffering period for my family. And uh, when you go in hospital and you see suffering of people. Your your point of view about life change. Yeah. It was a completely unexpected episode in, in our life and it shake all our family. When he passed away, I I decided to to finish my PhD, but I wanted to change my life. In some aspect, I, I, I didn't realize at that at that moment it would have been in uh, in cycling or in sport in general. I just wanted to do something big. Like live life in a really good way in a quality way uh giving like 200 percent of myself in in every day yeah. like live like it was the last day of my life every day so um it, it i had more energy when he, he died uh it was like living for for two people so i had like more energy to do everything and then uh it was casual actually to some at some point i i bought a bike a road bike and i started to cycle and i i started with triathlon because i i was a runner you before could, yeah you could runner and yeah. it was the only thing i could do running so <laughs> i was not really good on the bike yeah but then uh, triathlon is really common in in uk yeah so i started to do triathlon but yeah. I, I still didn't have in mind to do something big um, I'd always did this um, thing in my mind. Uh, at some point, it will come. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, when I did my first race in uh, duathlon, I realized that I was good in cycling. And then I said, "Okay, let's focus on cycling." And you just realized you had some talent there, even though you had trained as a runner for. Yes, I think that the 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 motor that athletics gives you yeah. to your body is good enough right. for a, a good. Uh, cycling, right. not really like elite cycling. I say that's good cycling. So, but if you train uh, in a in a good way, then uh, you can be like uh, you you can grow up like really fast, pretty quickly. Yeah, cause yeah, you're a good pace, quickly. yeah. So I start to race, and uh, and then I was contacted at some point from a professional team in Italy, hmm. and uh, I was like at my third year of my PhD, so almost finishing the PhD. So I decided to move back to Italy to meet the team. And uh, how did they find you? They just saw like you had some good results. Um, yeah, good results. And also the manager of the team was in UK, uh, just an amatorial uh, team, yeah. was a uh, next pro cyclist in, uh, in Italy. And he had some contact with professional team in Italy. So we got in contact with the team. And um, because he suggested me, okay. You're good, probably in the pro peloton. So let, let's try to contact the team and let, let's just try for yeah. a stage. So I did this stage, and it was good. So I decided to move back to Italy and finish my my PhD uh, just Remotely. by email because yeah, it was wow. at the end of the day it was just writing the yeah. final thesis. Yeah. So I didn't need to be there. Right. Uh, but in the meantime, I was working also 
as a postdoc in uh, Imperial College from mm. abroad, so from from Italy. And then uh, I I started my my cycling adventure. Um, after a couple of years, I realized that I I found uh, what 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 was the original uh, thoughts uh, after the death of my father. Yeah. And it was like do a world record, and uh, the 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 most uh, prestigious thing in cycling is the hour record. So I said, okay, I want to do the world hour record. <laughs> and then he's locked in on that. Yeah, yeah. And, I think what you said with uh, living life for two people is really uh, like a stunning quote. I, I think that 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 definitely resonates with me. Um, that you're able to take such a painful loss and turn that such a motivating factor in, yeah. in driving your life. And hopefully like none of our listeners need to have such a physical loss to take some of that motivation yeah. uh, to drive and, and create their own dreams. So our record, you somewhat, you basically kind of transitioned and were spotted as a cycling talent and, and that kind of kicked off this cycling journey because like, again i think a lot of people that end up setting world records the typical story is that you know there's a seven-year-old kid that just wanted to you know play football or wanted to play something yeah. and just did that for their entire lives um and then just like keyed in on it and had parents that like kind of trained them and like coached them up but you kind of were just kind of you're a triathlete do athlete right like you were a kind of runner cycling and then your cycling was just good enough to you know, ramp up really, really quickly. Which yeah. I guess isn't like atypical for you because you kind of did the same thing with math, right? Because <laughs> yeah. you're like, you're kind of yeah, it's really didn't really similar. focus on math yeah. and then you kind of ramped up. And then I guess the similar story with cycling. So I'm scared about what will happen next. <laughs> <laughs> what was the, 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 the timing on this? So you got your first sort of professional cycling slot and then you wanted to attempt the hour record. And, and, and pursue that, um, that was like not a lot of time, right? It was no. like a couple of years or something, right? Yeah, because in 2013, yeah. I bought the bike yeah. and I was still falling down because I couldn't unclip the, the shoes right. from the pedal. Yeah. So <laughs> it was like <laughs> embarrassing, I have to yeah. say, because at the cross lights, you don't have like, uh, you, you're not still used to unclip the, the shoes because the shoes for cycling are not normal shoes. So right. you have to unclip the shoes. Yeah. So at the at the beginning, you have this like embarrassing falling down because you cannot unclip the shoes. So right. that was in 2013. Then in 2014, I was like in Fiandre, <laughs> which is like so funny because uh, I was already in the professional team in yeah. the Pro Peloton. Yeah. And I, I have to say, I wasn't ready for that because riding professionally with that Peloton in uh, races like Fiandre. Yeah. Uh, it's, you don't need just the leg, but you need to know how teams work uh, and the tactics, strategies, right. and uh, stay in a peloton of 200 rider, really aggressive peloton. Right. So my experience was not really good in, uh, in road racing because I, I realized that, okay, I've, I've legs, but it's not enough. Yeah. Uh, the races that were good uh, were Tridon, uh, Tridon, sorry, uh, Time Trial. Yeah. Uh, where I was alone, uh, just me against the, the 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 clock. Right. So I, you need technicalities in Time Trial too, but not as Fiandre or big races in, yeah. in the peloton. Hey, this is Jeff Wu jumping in here real quick to share a really nice HVMN customer testimonial. This one is from Trevor J, who's a student at Mississippi State. Let's listen to what he has to say about Sprint, our nootropic for acute focus. I take Sprint when I'm trying to write papers, when I have a test the next day, anything like that. I don't necessarily take Sprint on a daily basis, but I take it when I need it. I also take Sprint when I have soccer. I began experimenting with nootropics in soccer about my freshman year, I want to say. And so I started taking it in practice. I really liked the way I was playing, the way I was thinking. And so I took it during games and now I take it every time I play soccer. I personally don't understand why more people don't take nootropics when it comes to sports because that mental side is huge when it comes to sports. You're able to think extremely clear. You're able to focus, you're narrowing in, you're not worried about who's texting you, who's Facebooking you, nothing like that. You're able to focus. Great to hear that Sprint is helping you out in both school and sport, Trevor. Thanks so much. 
This month's special podcast offer is 15% off our HVMN performance supplements line, which includes Sprint. Simply visit www.hvmn.com slash pod to claim the offer. Again, that is www.hvmn.com slash pod. This offer ends December 31st, 2018. Now back to the program. I didn't grow up a cycling fan, but I've obviously gotten to know the sport a little bit, you know, with some, you know, you know, with like working with you and other cyclists, um, you know, and I think a lot of Americans, you know, some are cycling fans, but I would say like the broad majority of people like, you know, kind of know about the Tour de France. Um, what is the strategy? What are the tactics? I mean, obviously, you know, I can speak a little bit towards this, but, you know, what are the things that you obviously saw, you know, firsthand that aren't obvious to someone who's never done cycling or, or watched professional cycling? Like, what are the tactics uh, that that are not non-obvious yeah, in, the, in, the, in, a, in a road race? So you have to imagine there is a peloton. Yeah. And at some point, there is a rider that tries to escape the peloton. The brake. Yes. So it's a breakaway. Yeah. Now you have radio that connect to the to the car. And from the radio, you know which rider is the, the one that is in the breakaway. Yeah. So in that breakaway, uh, ev- every, the, uh, at least one rider of every team should be there because the, the breakaway is going to, to go for the win. So you need to be sure that every team put one rider in the breakaway. So that moment in which the, the breakaway born is right. really chaotic because you can imagine that every team wants a rider in the breakaway. Right. And if the breakaway doesn't contain uh, your rider, the team have to catch the, the breakaway and right. close the breakaway. Right. So it's th- this movement it means that the peloton is really chaotic in that in that time that like is like five minutes even everyone's less shuffling and everyone's yeah, like even five, less. Yeah. I have to say no maybe maybe not f- not five minutes but like less 45 seconds yes yeah. <laughs> less than a minute yeah. so if you are in the in the back of the of the bunch you have to move forward and go on the front and uh, try to escape or to to catch the breakaway or right. to close the the gap and uh, every everything is if you're not used to that the first time you just you lose the peloton right and there's like also like a huge difference between you know tailgating or, or catching people's yeah. break right yeah well also there are like strategies in moving around the peloton right. because it depends on the wind right if there is headwind or lateral wind and uh, and then sometimes the um, the car call you to take water right. for the uh, the car captain yeah and so you have to go back to the to the car and take water and go f- to the throw the peloton right. and give water to all team member. So it's it's hard. And if there is a climbing, you have to help uh, the the, the, the climber, the right. leader, uh, and push in the climbing, uh, but n- not much uh, in the in the right way. Right. So there are many things that require a lot of time. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, it's so. Yeah, it's like non-obvious, right? Uh, like it's like, but no. it's definitely just like there's so much nuances at the very, very high levels. Like yeah. when do you time the break away? How do you, yeah. you know? So I wasn't prepared for people? that. That's that's yeah. the reality. I have to I have to be honest with yeah. myself. So I had good legs. Uh, also, in for example, in team training, I realized that I had good legs with yeah. respect to the other, but. It was it was not enough in the in the race because right. I didn't have this uh, you have the smart mind right. uh, to know what to do in which time. Right. So I spent like two years trying to learn in a professional team. Mm-hmm. I race a lot around the world. It was really important for me, but mm-hmm. uh, the, the the time was telling me that uh, I was good. Mm-hmm. Not in road racing, but just time trial. Yeah. So me a time trial bike. A uh, course of uh, 20k, 30k, so an effort of 30, 40 minutes. So much more similar to athletics, right? Where you have to run uh, in the track for 40 minutes, maybe 30, 40 right. minutes if you do 10,000 meters, for example. Right. So it was really like parallel the, the effort, uh, and so I I realized that maybe. I have to focus on that. Yeah. But just time trial was not enough. So I wanted to do something more. And yeah. uh, 
famous long term trial that lasts one hour is our record. But it's funny because yeah. when I realized that, I also realized that I wasn't able to stay on the track because I, I never entered in a track. So stay in the track means that you need to pedal uh, on a bike that is not like a road bike. Mm. So it's a bike without brake brakes, which is something that already scared me. If <laughs> There's <laughs> no brakes on it. Yeah, because it's dangerous. Because the thing that uh, keeps you high in the, in a velodrome, because you have is your banking speed, angle, is your, is it's your, the speed, so right. it's the... Um, Centrifugal yes. force. Yeah. So it, it's dangerous if you brake, because you, you fall down. Like. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know the time trial bikes or the, the velodrome bikes had no brakes. So yeah. you just... And you have fixed gear. Yeah. So you, you have to pedal. Uh, always otherwise if you fall down again yeah. so i have to i spent the first year in uh, 2016 trying to to understand my how can i stay on the on the black line in the velodrome can we set some context on our record so it's it's like one of the oldest most prestigious records in cycling it's a very pure record because it is again you your yeah. bike in a velodrome and control yeah. environment. Weather conditions are all the same for yeah. everyone. So yeah. yeah. And I know that there's like been an interesting history with that record because in, in a certain time gap, like people could have like custom bikes that were like yeah. very, very yeah. uh optimized just for the velodrome where they're like like almost lying down. Yeah. Like these yeah. very, very weird designs. Yeah. And now just I think in the last few years they just standardized the types of bikes that could set yeah. this proper hour record. It is kind of pity for me because uh, I, I enjoyed that part of uh, being creative uh, with uh, your aerodynamics, with right. your position. There were a lot of study around the, the several positions that they they adopted right. in, the, in the past. And uh, so I, honestly, I'm a fan of science. Uh, so... I don't find really nice to to cut and put this the limit just into yeah, like to the, leave the it, standard yes. bike. Form. If I want to 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 investigate on some weird position, why not? I mean, it's <laughs> it's point of view. At some point, you have to standardize yeah. everything. I understand that, but from the other point of view, is uh, you know, it's it's a limit to to the mind yeah. to to research. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that is sport, though. Sport is kind of a human defined limit of how you get score things right it yeah. is pretty random why is a three point basket this no. line two point you know everything at some levels arbitrary so yeah so there is some arbitrary limit now but it's still like but this is the standard way that people sort of measure who is the best pure cyclist yeah. right for for that hour so let, let's describe the velodrome so it's like a curved track Yes. Or what's the steepest bank? Like a 45? Like, 45 degree. So the steepest part is a 45 degree angle. Yeah, it keeps the same uh, for the wall, uh, the wall length. So okay. uh, when, when you when you go out of the flat part, right. it's already at 45. So it's, it's just more scaring. Yeah, it's just more scaring when you are up because yeah. you see all the, all the velodrome uh, uh, under. But yeah, it's it's all the same. And then when you said the black line, that's like the that's like it's the, the first track. line okay. that you you meet uh, after you you leave the the flat part. Okay. So it's as close as as possible to the to the flat part. Okay. You have to stay on the black line because if you stay there, you save meter. Right. So you you can ride everywhere in the velodrome. Right. But when you do the hour record, you want to be as, as close as, as possible. possible. Yes. Because okay, so if you go too far out. That means you, you lose time, you, you, you do more meter. Right. And uh, So yeah. you're doing more effort per meter because yes. you're drifting. You're not pushing your energy straight in that line. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Also because the, the length of the track, it's, uh, it's 250 meters. Yeah. But it's measured on the black line. I see. So if you go uh, out of the black line, you maybe do 252 meters. And you're not getting credit for it. Yeah. And that two meters, every lap. At the end of, Adds up. if you have to do 200 laps, it's a lot of meters. Yeah, that's the world record. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then if you go too far in, you fall off the... You cannot because there are obstacles on the on the flat part. Oh, so so you, there are like sponges yeah. that, uh, I mean, you can you go down. on the sponges, 
that, that but they, they're going to slow you down more friction okay. yeah but also if you go like a 48 you cannot stay on the flat part because you will just will sleep so you have to stay exactly on on that range yeah uh, they, they say that four fingers from the sorry four fingers from the black line oh, yeah. is the the best part Huh. to stay so four finger up and four finger down so it's like maybe 10 centimeter of uh of line yeah. so your trajectory for one hour have to be in 10 centimeter right so it's <laughs> if you think about yeah, that so, like, so i'm just visualizing this so you're basically staring at this black line as you're pedaling for your life essentially <laughs> as hard as you can and like trying to track this as closely as possible and you do that for an hour yes. is that like Kind of the way for folks that, that are listening to kind of visualize how, how, you know, what that experience is kind of like. It's like you are staring at a line and like pedaling as hard as you can and trying to keep your bike on that line. Yeah, you have to practice a lot. Yeah. Because it, 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 if you try the first time, it, you, you will say, oh, okay, it's impossible. Yeah. You, probably you will be able to keep that for two laps, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you, you have to keep practicing also because the position is uncomfortable so your head have to be really low yeah so i i i don't see far away i don't see uh in front of me right. anything i just see the the black line yeah. uh, because also i have the my hand are uh, uh, hiding my head yeah uh, oh, right, because, like in front of you, right? Yes, because you have to imagine like a kind of Superman position. Right. So the, the hand, uh, I have to hide head yeah. to cut the wind, uh, the hair resistance. Right. So the head is really low and you look just at the, just a little bit in front of the wheel. So the, 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 the visual, visually, you have really the wheel, you see the wheel and uh, let's say alpha meter. Uh, in front of the wheel. You're not really seeing much. No, I don't see anything. Yeah. That's why for my position was impossible to to have a indication of lap uh, of the lap time, right. the lap split uh, from a computer. Right. Because some coaches use the computer to to show you on the on a laptop the the, the time uh, right. of your lap split at the um just at the board of the truck. Right. But for me, it was not possible to see the, the laptop. So my boyfriend was, was just shouting to me the lap split every lap. Yeah. And you were able uh, to hear? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we, we practice a lot of also that. Okay. So I was going to say, like, would you be distracted if someone's, you know, your boyfriend's yelling at you? Like, oh. No, you have to okay. practice everything. Also, the most obvious thing, like, communicate with someone, yeah. you have to practice because it's, it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. So visually, it's really, uh, it's really bad. Uh, also because you feel alone because one hour is really long yeah and you don't have in, any interaction uh with with the external yeah, when anything you're, when you're so in there, it's you're just in there. you and the black line yeah that's it so let's talk about your attempts and then your successful attempt so so obviously you had a big push in september of 2018 but you had a first attempt in 2017 right yeah in October. Um, yeah, let's talk about like that trajectory and, and your training and when you got confidence that, yes, this is what I want to focus you know, the next few years of my life to be, you know, the best in the world at. Um, so, so as you're going off the professional cycling teams, you realize yeah. that you were, had talent for the time trials and you started practicing on the velodrome. Yeah. At what point at, when you're playing around the velodrome were you like, okay, I'm going to go for the world record? When I started to think about the this world hour record, right. uh, it was 46 kilometers, yeah. <laughs> 273 meters. Yeah. And uh, so after a few months, it rises up to 47.980 right. right. meter. Uh, so it, 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 it was like scary because I was training for another distance. And at some point I have to say, okay, I have to add, uh, have to add more. <laughs> more than one kilometer. Yeah. And uh, I have to look at a new distance. So yeah. go over 48 kilometer per hour. Right. which is still scary for me to, to say uh, because it's, it's really fast yeah. <laughs> for one hour. Uh, I realized that I would have been able uh, at the end of 2016. So after uh, one year of practicing in the track, I said, okay, with some adjustment to position and material, I can like 
can try to do that. So that was the point when I started some uh, support from sponsor, mm -hmm. technical sponsor. So the the bike, uh, the uh, the the skin suites, and so on. And that's because uh, I, your training data showed signals that like, hey. Yes, I decided to go to altitude because it should help uh, a little bit yeah. the the performance. Uh, that's something that I'm not completely sure about because it, it depends on how your body reacts to the altitude. Right. Um, I really suffer the altitude. So I, I never did a good test in uh, at the sea level to right. compare like the yeah. two things. So uh, it's something that remains a mystery for me about uh, one hour at sea level. I mean, it is pretty standard. Most of the records have been set at altitude, right? Yeah, yeah. But, and, and the theoretical yeah. trade-off is that while you lose some oxygen, yeah, but, you get the aerodynamic yeah. efficiency of having less air to go through. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, I, there's, I, I mean, that's something that we've been, I'm, I've been interested in from a, per, uh, from a training perspective because there is sort of conflicting data around. Do you want to be, for, you know, I, I, I mean, it was interesting. I mean, obviously you made a decision to, you know, break the record at altitude. Yeah, but there are many factors actually yeah. around that that are like a little bit polemic maybe, but... Yeah, I mean, it's subtle. Is, I think it's just there's so many like conflicting variables. It's just not about numbers. It's also about like cost of hiring the truck. Oh. So that, that's the, the main point. That's something that I am I'm really angry with that because in Europe, yeah. if, you, if you want to hire a truck, it yeah. costs like one hour, costs like one month in Mexico. Whoa. So I ran the truck in Mexico for one month, cost the same As of I ran the truck hour. for one hour in Europe. That can be uh, United Kingdom, Velodrome. That's, that's, that's ridiculously that can, expensive. Yes. Jeez. So can yeah. you imagine an athlete that doesn't have a professional team like, okay, we can at the sky, so <laughs> with mm, a lot of money yeah. to, to ride in London truck. Right. But for me it was not really possible to to train and uh, hide the truck for the day of the of the tent right. it would have been like um, an amount that i i can even imagine and right. also in europe you have to warm up the truck because you don't have weather condition that you have in mexico so if you have to warm up the truck you need to pay a lot really a lot for um uh, like for, a team to, to of reach people like to, temperature that right. are ideal for the for the hour. So that 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 is something that because I, I want to say that people say okay you go to altitude so it's easier. I go to altitude because kind of mainly to economically economics. yeah it's it's easier. That's and it's something that it annoys me because I have to go to Mexico to train. Uh, uh, I didn't know that. To, That's an interesting part of the story. I, so I like did, when Bradley Wiggins set the men's hour record, he was doing it in, in London. In London, but he said also that I'm, I'm saying at sea level because I, I did some tests in altitude and yeah. it's not convenient. I think the same, basically. I think that altitude training is not so convenient because the main thing is that your body can react not really well to the right. altitude. Right. So it's just about is is personal. There are some people that takes just a few days to to adapt. Right. For me, it takes a long. And yeah. even if when I, I adapt it, I lose too much in terms of power. Right. So I, I think the same. But honestly, is if you are like not in a professional team and you don't have a big budget, it's it's impossible to to try to do an hour regular at sea level at the moment. I'm thinking about Australia also. It's the same. It's too much. For example, I did some winter training yeah. for the hour and they asked it to Palma di Mallorca to go there uh, for training in yeah. the winter. And the price are just like more than 200 euro for just one hour training. So when I prepared for the hour, I had to go to Mexico, even in the winter right. to train. That's that just because if you don't have a big budget, but I mean, really big budget because right. 200 euro for just one hour means that. I mean, how many hours did you spend on the, yeah, exactly. the hundreds, at, thousands at of hours? Like, let's say six hours a week. So yeah. three times, uh, two hours every every time. Yeah, so yeah. it's like 1,200 euro per a week. week. Just so for track time. Who can do that? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Even if, even if you have like, really big sponsor you 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 really need something else like 
a, a big team or I don't know, but right. some some agreement with the truck or something like that because I mean, first, it, just, yeah. it just stacks up, right? Yeah, In Italy, it was the same. I just said, uh, uh, I'm really thankful to the national team that allow me to train with them. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I would have spent like millions of euro. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting, subtle point ac- around like the business of sport. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, what other things were you really dialing in? Obviously, aerodynamics, obviously, selection of the course and being able to have enough hours on the course. You're really, really comfortable with, with the course. Uh, you mentioned weather as an interesting variable because if there's, I guess, certain types of storm fronts or types of air density, that would have impact the attempt. Um, nutrition, tra- you know, I, I guess like what are some of the other variables that you had to really dial in that you can share with our audience? My experience was that position was one of the most crucial thing. Mm-hmm. For example... Uh, the my pre- my previous attempt, the one that I failed, yeah. uh, was mainly because my position was not studied in a uh, very good way. In mm. the sense that I was I was trying to be too much aero, but biomechanically I was not efficient. So you need really need to find a good compromise. Mm. I had like my sponsor that uh, drug to zero that allowed me to go to the wind tunnel. Mm-hmm. So we did some tests. Was the first thing that we did after the first attempt, right? To really see, okay, I, I maybe I go higher in position. Uh, aerodynamically, I lose something, but I'm much more efficient. Right. Like in pedaling, I don't lose power and things like that. So sometimes we are obsessed with being aerodynamics as much as possible, but you really always have to think about how your body reacts. Right. It's the same discussion of the altitude is like, okay, theoretically it's like that, but this kind of thing you have to consider personally, how your body reacts to position, to altitude. Nutrition is the same. Yeah, I cannot be on a too strict diet because <laughs> I get crazy. Yeah, So I prefer to like be obsessed by, for example, uh, the um, uh, heat healthy, right. but not too much like strict diet. Like, Interesting. Yeah, because I think a lot of our audience members have played with, with fasting, ketogenic diets, low carb diet. How would you, so? How would you describe your diet? I try to like avoid unhealthy food. Okay. But if I'm hungry, uh, I I don't like restrict myself too much. If I right. want like a dish of pasta, which is like uh, more uh, full of uh, usual. Yeah. Uh, I, I will just go for it. Right. If, I mean, not not every day. It's like it, it has to be a good compromise. So mm-hmm. not every day I feel like hungry and uh, and I want a lot of right. pasta. It's just sometimes, if I want it, why not? Right. Uh, because I don't want to be too restrictive. Because I I come from training. I suffered a lot, and right. it's like a price. So sometimes you have just to. To give price to to your body, to your mind. Uh, yeah, no, I hundred percent agree. I think there's something very, but th- something that is this individuality towards yeah. what the body responds better to. And I think, you know, for people that have weight management issues when they're an athlete, then you might want a more strict dietary intervention. But if you don't have weight management issues, then you just want things that give you ample amount of power. I think it's just like figuring out what works for you, right? Yeah, so for exactly. you, it's like you just are less strict on yeah. the macro ratios. You're you're not really calorie counting any of that. No, I tried. Okay. I tried to count calories. It was just not it's, useful for it's, you? It's useful if you can do it. Yeah. But it depends how, how you react like psychologically. Yeah. I feel too stressed about counting calories. Right. So I just like said, okay, let, let's, let's be focused on trying a good compromise. Right. Some days you are more hungry. Let's eat a little bit more if you feel that. Right. Trying always to to avoid like uh, a lot of oil, uh, uh, like um, topping and this kind of fried uh, things. Yeah. So it's like I think I found a good compromise. Yeah. It's different. For example, always about nutrition, about integration. So I'm really obsessed about being like really precise on uh, on like. Uh, n- nutrition around the, the usual food that you have for 
uh, lunch and dinner. So right. uh, integration of uh, protein, uh, uh, drinking ketone at the right time, right. Uh, in the right quantities, uh, and uh, investigate about why I have to take protein, why I have to take uh, ketone at this time of the day. Okay, so and you care more about timing. Yeah, it's exactly. like very important. Yeah, timing and quantities. Yeah. Uh, and uh, try to don't forget to keep I don't know your vitamins like every day yeah. uh, your shake every day so I think I'm I'm quite obsessed about uh, all the, the this side of nutrition. Do you have tight eating windows? Because you know some athletes will try to have shorter eating windows or they have like a lot of meals all the time right after workouts. Do you try to you know tighten your eating windows, for example, in in the sense that you have a late breakfast or you do fasted training sometimes. Mm. Do you do you play around with periodizing diet with your training blocks, or is it pretty regimented uh, every single day? Like you have a, a set day and you don't really change up your your routines. Uh, in the winter, I change it. Okay. Uh, because yeah, fasted diet are really common in the winter yeah. because you are like starting again, so you are a little bit fat (laughs) (laughs) because you come from holidays and you know like every athlete on holidays just just eat like (laughs) uh, (laughs) you know it's i think it's normal it's good to have like kind of uh break the rule during the holiday so you need to start again with fasted ride yeah and uh, it's good training for your metabolism to like ramp up your fat oxidation because you're you don't have like all this glucose and ketones floating around you need to yeah yeah. train your muscles to be able to dig into its reserves yeah interesting yeah, yeah. yeah. so yes i play a, a little bit in the winter while in the during the race time yeah. i'm really like i have my tent table my my food and uh every day I have to be like uh consistent with the other yeah also because on the race day you don't want any surprise yeah so uh, the day before i prepare everything yeah. in uh, chronological order on yeah. the table and I'm really, really precise, really obsessive because I suffer a lot of stomach problem. Uh, so if I don't respect my quantities and my time to yeah. uh, to eat and drink uh, in the race, I'm, I really have problem. Yeah, that's right? one thing that I think not a lot of non-athletes don't realize the impact. I mean, I wasn't necessarily a serious athlete and GI issues for fueling just seemed like, what, what are you, like, how is that even a concern? But as I've gotten more into you know, training myself and of course, talking with professionals like yourself. I mean, GI is a huge factor for all of this stuff. It's surprising that it's such a big impact. GI is such an important thing to manage, which is kind of surprising for non-professionals. You think, oh, like, you know, I don't really have diarrhea problems. But like when you're exerting that hard, you really have those kinds of issues. It depends on the effort you're going to do. Uh, In training, sometimes you can have like, a uh, small change in, in your diet, yeah. it will affect you. But in the thing is that you never reach in training the effort you have to reach in race. Yeah. Don't tell, don't ask me why. Probably it's the adrenaline of right. the race that you push yourself really beyond your limits, much right. more than in training. Uh, so in training, you can do a little bit of changes. Uh, also because th- there are many more days of training with respect to race. So right. it, it happened that sometimes, for example, the, the, the day before you can have a, a dinner out with friend and you drink some a glass of wine, for example, you, right. you feel that yeah, in sure. the, the, day, the day after. Yeah. Uh, so you feel everything. Uh, so it can be that you are not perfect on every day in training. Uh, but in the race, if you do something wrong, you will pay that. Yeah. So it will be a moment in which you have so much problem, your legs feel heavy, uh, you have ADH uh, yeah. because digestive problem. And right. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm really careful about that. So what does like the meal structure look like? Do you have like your rice, broccoli? I mean, like what are what are the typical things that you you eat? So the first thing in in my day is coffee. Okay. I try to avoid sugar. Okay. Uh, and then I have uh, hot with milk, uh, okay. semi skimmed milk, yeah. so about fat milk. Okay. And then I usually have a uh, uh, protein pancake uh, or uh, uh, some bread, uh, integral bread uh, with uh, some protein like um, uh, ham, 
or mm. uh, salmon, smoked salmon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, then it depends on the on the effort I'm going to do. Uh, if there are like strong effort, like a race test or something like that, right. I, I stop eating uh, like four hours before the, the effort. Mm-hmm. Three, four hours. Are you kind of snacking up towards it or just like you have your breakfast? I was used to have some snack since I tried ketone. Yeah, that okay. ketone like <laughs> was a re- revolutionary part of my life. <laughs> because yeah, when you drink ketone, then yeah. you are like, you, you don't feel like the necessity of uh, eating more. So right. I, I drink my ketone when I know I have to drink it. Okay. And then I'm I'm okay. Maybe I just drink some carbo carbo drink or right. electrolyzed drinking, but not much. It's a little bit of liquid just to yeah, keep and, your and mouth. Yeah, and I can train like without eating uh, anything. So mm. I, I feel like also because, I mean, I for the hour, you don't train like six hours. So you have to do like some quality riding. So it will be like two hour riding, uh, full gas riding, but it, it's like two, maximum three hour mm-hmm. usually. So uh, I'm I'm just be careful uh, to hit uh, just straight after the training. So as I don't have any uh, food during training, you have to be careful to have some recovery, drinking, shake right. uh, of protein, uh, uh, electrolytes, uh, vitamin, uh, right. um, amino acid. Have you tried ketone for recovery as well? Or are you mainly using it as a pre-fuel? I use mainly as pre-fuel. Okay. I have to say, yes. And uh, uh, so I, I, I do this shake yeah. and then uh, I, I do shower and everything at some point of lunch, a kind of lunch. Right. It's, it's not proper lunch because usually it's at three o'clock in the, in the afternoon. So right. because the routine is, is quite long, I have to right. say. And uh, so I have this kind of uh, light lunch yeah. with some, I, I eat everything, but the quantities are small, like some pasta or rice, yeah. uh, chicken and salad, this kind of thing. So right. it's just one dish, but with everything, a little bit of everything. Yeah. Then a snack, a snack in the, before dinner, uh, like a yogurt or some walnuts. So you would say like fairly lighter towards the end of the day in terms of yeah. The caloric load. Yeah, yeah. Because my breakfast is really big. Is it's there, really big. So yeah. I can go like until like three o'clock. Yeah. Um and also I think that the one of the effects of ketone is that it keeps your um uh, appetite down. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. We definitely should talk offline and, and figure out if we should experiment with the uh, recovery aspects. A lot of the Tour de France feedback has been on the recovery side. They feel fresher with the legs. Yeah. Uh, post post uh, post exertion, so we should experiment with that. Yeah. So I'd love to talk about the attempt in September and then the eventual uh, breaking the world record. So you had two attempts back to back. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one that's like crazy because, like, I mean, you we went like what, like forty minutes or so. Forty four. Forty four <laughs> minutes. You know, going as hard as you can, and then you. You, you you stop uh, and then you go again the next day yeah. uh, and then actually break the record. Can you talk us through that? What, what was going through your head? What went wrong the first day? What yeah. was that story? So the, the, the story is that uh, I was unlucky with the weather the on 12th of September, so yep. the first day. When I wake I up... Michael, like we were talking to Michael, when, when is Vittoria going to do it? And he's like, and Michael is saying, you know... Like the weather, like we don't know exactly the date anymore. I know so because we, yeah, that, we there was a storm in the night. Yeah. So when I wake up in the morning, it was so cold. I, I was many months in, in Mexico in my yeah. life and I never experienced such a cold weather. Yeah. So as I was saying before, when you have not really good temperature, the air density change. Yeah. And this means that you have to, to change also your power. Mm. And so we, we are speaking about marginal gains. So if the air density is not exactly what you want, it's going to be like difficult and struggling to to break the the world record. So we uh, we measure the air density and we decide with the, my my coach to don't don't try that day because it was really too cold, and also there are no warming up uh, uh, ventilation in uh, in in Mexico track. Mm-hmm. So it was like twenty degree, even less. 
and it's it's cold even for a training it's cold yeah so we decided to go there just for a spinning the legs and yeah. uh, just for a training to prepare the legs for the day after yeah. because I booked the truck for two days right so I w- it was okay with commissar and everything uh, so I went there just for training and uh, I was relaxed because it was not no more the day of race. Right. It was just a training day. So yeah. I was relaxed and put the music as usual. And at some point the sun came out yeah. and the sun in Mexico is strong. So the, the, the velodrome in like less than one hour rise from uh, 20 degrees to 32 maybe so it was was warm enough yeah. really warm actually yeah. and so there was like confusion about uh, what can i do now why i have to to lose a day yeah. because now the the weather conditions are perfect actually for to try so like in 15 minutes i decide okay i'm warmed up let, let's go it's uh, i was like stupid really stupid because you know it's it's the adrenaline of the day i understand yeah. but I should have been like more quiet because I decided with my coach not to start, right. uh, try the next day and I shouldn't be influenced by, by anything else. Right. But yeah, I, w- I was You're like, excited. Yeah, I was so, you know, emotional that day that I took a decision that w- was the wrong one. Right. So when I started, my legs felt really good, I yeah. have to say, because I was in a good shape. Yeah. But mentally, I wasn't never prepared to... Yeah, I mean... It, I was really close yeah. because at 40 minutes I was uh, at 47920 uh, right. so like okay. just 60 meter beyond um, under sorry the yeah. the record pace yeah. but you know my boyfriend was shouting to me the lap splits and sometimes he said speed up speed up yeah. because we are close but we are not on the record pace right and I just couldn't because you know that that is the difference between training and racing so in racing you have to really like push a little bit than usual training and if you have the right adrenaline you can push yeah. the limit right uh, if you're in training you okay you push a lot you feel like like you're dying right but it's never like a race right. and in that day i was like more in a training mood then your your racing. mental game wasn't there. Yes. Yeah. I had to speed up just a little bit, but I was already in an uncomfortable zone. Right. So I said, I cannot speed up more. And uh, so I just, I said to myself, okay, let's, let's try to sprint a little bit. See if I speed up. Yeah. I wouldn't speed up. And so at 44 minutes, I decided to, to stop. Yeah. And everyone was surprised because I was like. You were close. Yeah, from outside you cannot yeah. realize that yeah. you are not breaking the the hour because right. I was so close, but I I wanted really to break the hour record yeah. this time. So I wanted I was confident I could do. So I decided to do the day after when so I came back home. Forty four minutes and like, you were just okay. This is not today is not the day. Like yeah. I want to stop. There was so much adrenaline. Yeah, it was a decision that was taken like from instant yeah. side of your body. Right. But when I came back home, I realized my choice. I started to cry. Because, <laughs> like, I mean, because, you were going as hard as you could, right? For 44 yeah. minutes. I mean, that's a lot of exertion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but so you so were tired, right? I, I was okay. so tired. And I said, I'm, I'm not going to do that. It's, I, I, again, another stupid choice. Yeah. I was wrong with everything. I was wrong with the decision of starting. Yeah. I was starting with the decision of stopping. Yeah. Uh, so I was wrong with everything. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm wasting like my, my opportunity. Yeah. Uh, but then maybe it was, was the, this sensation that uh, that day, yeah. if I uh, uh, wouldn't push uh, like everything, I would have lost all the the last two, three days, right. the two, two, three years of my life. Right. So that, that kind of uh, sensation of survival that give me the the uh, that extra energy to go. Yeah. But the first minutes of the of the ride the, the day after, it, it was awful because the the legs were so so heavy. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, the, I'm sure you were. Exa- so, you, so yeah, what was the night like? The, the between the twelfth and the thirteenth, you go home, you feel frustrated, angry at yourself. Yeah. you're crying. We, we had a pizza. Okay, <laughs> that, that, that night. Up a bit. Yeah, be, yeah, because we 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 couldn't 
eat again rice and chicken like usually. Yeah. So we just need to relax because was th- there was too much tension. It was just me and my boyfriend yeah. there. So we were scared. We were like disappointed. So we yeah. said, okay, let, let's just relax. Yeah. Let's, let's take a pizza. Let's see a movie yeah. and uh, do some stretching and then go to bed. Yeah. And uh, so we we go to bed and uh, I, I, I kept well? crying. No, I kept crying I like know, until three saying. o'clock in the morning. Yeah, okay. So I had, like really like I, I was so nervous yeah. because uh, I wanted to find the energy and yeah. I couldn't find the energy I needed for for a for a world record. Right. I was like that I think until the the morning and uh, so you had like, like what like four or five hours of sleep. Yes, probably. So uh-huh. what was everything was against the planning, so yeah. against the, the 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 perfect day of of a race yeah. that an athlete won. So uh, when I entered the, the velodrome, yeah. uh, I realized that was really my last opportunity to give a sense of uh, my last two three years. I spoke a lot with my father. I, I I'm not religious, so I I don't I don't think there is something after the death right. but in for some mind, reason you were yeah, thinking in, about him but for some reason you know I, I said I feel like uh, living to life so I, I, I said okay we, we are two people now so we, we are a team and uh, I, I had this extra energy to, to, to give it all Right, and uh, also my boyfriend was so supportive uh, that day. So it, that day, actually, he was shouting to me not much the lap speeds, but shouting encouraging words right. every lap. And uh, uh, after twenty minutes, my legs start to feel better. Right, because you're still sore, but you, you need yes, that. And the, you're yeah, the first even though, don't, even during the warm up, did you know that? Yes, you knew you were a little off, but. Yeah. But your your mind was like, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do yes. this. I'm gonna do this. Yes, I was so focused. My mind was so focused. Uh, also because I mean, I, I've done many training, like hard training. Yeah. So I said, okay, um, yeah. I did like I don't know, Stelvio climbing. Yeah. Like Saturday and Sunday, I did already like two days, two consecutive days. I've right. done many times. So I mean, I, it would be like suffering. At You've the end of the before. day, yeah, I've done yeah. it before, so I don't have to be scared. Yeah. And uh, so after 20 minutes, I start to feel better. And the worst part is the middle part, because, you know, at the middle, you, you're, still so you're far not away. fresh right. anymore, and you don't see the hand. Yeah. Uh, so the, the minutes between 20 and 40 uh, were the more riskous, but I felt actually better than the first part. Okay. So that, that encouraged me. Right. After 40 minutes, I speed up so much. Right. Like uh, riding at 48 and uh, 500 yeah. uh, average. So that was the point in which I started to believe it was possible. Yeah. And uh, so the last 20 minutes were the the best 20 minutes <laughs> of my life, I think, because it was so exciting. I felt so fast uh, yeah. and uh, plenty of energy. And uh, I, I was I was seeing the dream really approaching to me. I was like yeah. dreaming about that in the last three years. And at some point I said, okay, I'm here. So it's the, 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 I'm just 20 minutes away from the dream. So it, it was so exciting. When I stopped, I didn't realize the, anything. I, I was like just shouting to release the, the adrenaline. Yeah. But yeah, no it, it took a little bit it? to realize the... That I broke the record. Wow. Yeah. And when you knew you were on pace and over pace, it sounded like you were joyful that you were like living out this dream. Was it not distracting to think about winning or were you focused on like, I guess like thinking about winning or breaking a world record, was it not distracting while you're still in, in the attempt? On the contrary, it was like it was uh, pushing me. Okay. Yeah. So I was saying, okay, I'm going to do that. I, yeah. I will do that. So. It was really the my motivation. And then when you finished, you didn't even notice. You didn't even realize. No, that. because actually it was just 27 meters, which means like it's I broke so it tight. for three seconds, maybe. Yeah. So you don't realize three seconds. Uh, it's so I, I wanted to be sure. And uh, so my boyfriend said, you do it. You, you did it. Yeah. And so I started to shout because I I didn't I didn't know what <laughs> what to think. And the first thing 
that I, I did was to kiss the truck. <laughs> Because you know it's 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 just you and the truck, so yeah. it was like I, I I was thankful with the truck. I don't know how to say, but it's just uh, you have this sensation of respect yeah. and uh, and love to the to the truck because I spent so much time with with her. Right. So the first thing that I did before kissing my boyfriend was kissing the truck. <laughs> <laughs> I was thankful with my boyfriend because it it did everything for for me really. Yeah. is uh it's not just uh the something that you expect from a human being it's uh, it was like a, a psychological support a mechanic right. a, a physiotherapist uh uh every a friend uh, so everything so it, it was my my team in that moment so yeah. uh, because you know we uh, it, it, that hours were really difficult because when I stopped the the first the first time yeah. uh, on twelve, it's like you feel also embarrassed to 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 explain to the world uh, to your sponsor. Right. Uh, that you know that they they are believing in you, so it's difficult to give them a justification to right. say them what what's going on. So I just switch off the phone, give to my boyfriend, and said, okay. I, let, let give me a few hours more and I have to, to realize this dream for, for everyone that is believing in me. Yeah. So we were just two at the end. It must have been such a culmination of so many different things to finally achieve and, and break a world record. Yeah. What, what did the rest of the night look like? Was it like eat more it's, some eat more pizza? <laughs> so like, or was it just like, I just want to sleep? It's weird to say, but I didn't want to relax too much. Huh. Because the, um, I knew that uh, I my season wasn't finished, so if I if I say to my body, I'm done. Uh, yeah, I'm done and relax for even for one day. I I think that my body would have relaxed too much. Yeah. Because I was really looking to relax to have some rest, so I have to be careful to to keep my body protect from freedom <laughs> it's yeah. like it's it's weird to say but I, I i had to go back on the bike the day after Whoa. to keep training because i <laughs> like uh, i had two other races yeah. in the in the season and uh, i know my shape was good yeah so I, I really wanted to to perform well uh in in competition especially with other athletes yeah because i was out of competition for two years and for me, it was really important to go back to competition. Right. So I wanted to keep like celebration like really small. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, we had the dinner, and uh, the, the day after, I was like chatting a lot with friends and uh, photos yeah. and the journalists from Italy. Right. So I, 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 it was a party environment, but I, I had my training. Go back. I had my it. training. Yeah. I had my food. Uh, I didn't change much from my routine, I have to say, and this pay off because I, I had my my two last races were really good. So yeah. after the 14th of October, so after one month of training, after the hour, I could like relax and right. party and uh, enjoy the 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 success of the season. Well deserved. So looking ahead, what's next? I know that. Obviously, you have big dreams ahead. You know, when you talk about like, accomplishing a dream, does, uh, is there a next dream? What is that next dream? Is there yeah. always going to be a next dream? So the, the dream, first of all, would be like uh, keep cycling. Yeah. Because it's not obvious, especially for uh, a female uh, cyclist where yeah. we don't have any contract uh, in Italy especially because it's still not recognized as a job mm. so it's all about uh, teams and sponsors so the, the first dream would be keep going with cycling yeah. and then uh, if I would be able to train I really would like to 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 do another step forward so concentrating in uh, 10 trial races and uh, still doing a lot of track because I, uh, I think the track training uh, is really the, the, the key uh, of a good training on, on the road too, yeah. and uh, I, I would like to to do a good performance at the national, and uh, also in international time trial. Uh, so try to be 
uh, to keep my my story a little bit particular. So I don't want to be like in a team, in a professional team. I want to to keep going with my story and do some quality job in time trial mm. because it's I always I've I've been always thinking that time trial is something different from road racing. Mm-hmm. So it's still cycling, but they are completely different and you need to focus on 10 trial, just on 10 trial if you want to specialize in 10 trial. So I want to pursue the, this street of uh, being a, a good quality uh, athlete in 10 trial and inspire, uh, especially in my country, uh, where the culture of 10 trial is not so high, like in uh, Netherlands, uh, like in uh, UK or here in US. Right. There are really good 10 trial and we don't have really good 10 trial mm. in Italy. So I would be like, try to... Almost build a sport in your home yes, country. Yes, yes. That, that would be the main thing. So yeah. uh, hopefully uh, I'm, I'm looking for good performances yeah. in 10 trial. And, uh, and hopefully 2020? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the dream of every athlete. So, but yeah, it's really a dream for now. Yeah. So it's like the thinking about the hour record three years ago. So, <laughs> well, I mean, I think given your track record and your dedication here, I mean, just gotta keep plugging at it every single day. Yeah. Yeah. So, where do our listeners follow you? How do they keep on top of your story? Obviously, we'll stay updated and, and continue to have these conversations as your career evolves in the cycling world. But how do people follow you? Twitter. Yeah. Uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, mm-hmm. and uh, usually I, I like Ms. to. Vittoria Bussi. Yes, Vittoria Bussi eighty seven for Facebook. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you can you can find me uh, like by Vittoria Bussi. I have a personal page and a athlete page profile. Yeah. So I like to to publish. Share, post, for, yeah. yeah, post my uh, some of my training, uh, my adventure out of the bikes. It would be nice to follow me. It's a rare opportunity to you know get in the mind of someone who just recently broke a world record. So again, congratulations and thank you very thanks much. for having the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very Church. much. Thanks for tuning in this week, everyone. Remember to check out www.hvmn.com slash pod for this month's special podcast offer. For December 2018, that offer is 15% off our entire HVMN performance supplements line. This is the perfect holiday gift for your friends, family, or even just treating yourself. Are you interested in getting $15 worth of HVMN store credit that you can use on our website? Submit a written review on our iTunes page and send that screenshot to podcast at hvmn.com. Our podcast email line is always open for your suggestions, feedback, and questions. Until next week, friends, stay sharp and train smart.